Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, you are very welcome to today's LinkedIn Live with me, Louise Brogan, and my lovely guest today, Veronica, also known as V, Sagastumi. V, welcome to the LinkedIn Live. Louise, I'm so excited. This is officially my first LinkedIn Live. So, right. woo! Excellent. Okay, so I warned you that this is really just like a talk all about your business. <laughs> A subject I know very well, so I'm ready for it. <laughs> so uh, for anyone who is a podcast listener on my podcast this week, um, V came on as an on-air coaching call um, guest, I guess, um, to ask me about uh, her burning questions about using LinkedIn for business. And now it's my turn to ask her all about her business because V has actually got really quite a fascinating business. But it's fascinating to me anyway. Um, and I think you will all really enjoy hearing about her business because she works with startups in Silicon Valley, which I think mm -hmm. is very exciting. So V, before we dive into anything, um, introduce yourself, please. Absolutely. So as you said, you know, I, I do go by V. So I don't know where that started. I think, you know, when you write a lot of emails, you your signature becomes a little too long when you have to write out Veronica. So it was just sign off as V. <laughs> <laughs> And so that's kind of like in our in our business circles, I go by that. But I to introduce myself is like I am a I am a business owner. I have had my business for uh, over 10 years now, mm -hmm. and it started out as uh, being a CFO consultant after a 20 year corporate career here in the Silicon Valley and Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, I'm coming to you. It's eight o'clock in the morning, Pacific Standard Time on a Friday morning. But uh, you're in a totally different country and different time zone. Yeah. Which is I like the internet. Yes, I know technology. You gotta love it. And so, I after a twenty-year corporate career with startups, um, playing a lot of different roles, like you know, controller, vi vice president of finance operations, chief financial officer, chief operating officer. I ventured out on my own, and mm -hmm. I started my I started to consult, as a lot of us do. We consult, and then we come to a, a fork in the road, mm -hmm. and we either decide to continue to just consult, which you will reach a cap or you decide to grow an agency type of model or, a, you know, just, I call it an agency, but in accounting, it is a firm or yeah, an agency. So for me, I decided to continue to grow the firm. The firm. That, yeah, the firm. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a John Grisham novel now. You know, I, I love that movie. I love that movie. And yeah. for a long time, I did not, I did not have a website for the for the business. It was just all word of mouth and LinkedIn, mm -hmm. which is funny because I never really thought of social media as a way to connect and attract clients. It was usually mm -hmm. the traditional network, right? Mm -hmm. It was attending uh, conferences, webinars, uh, mm -hmm. if not webinars, conferences, master classes, mm -hmm. uh, trade shows, different things, chamber yeah. of commerce events. You know, so um, so for me, once I decided to grow the business. I also started to look into how do I use social media mm -hmm. as a way to not only attract, but connect and continue the conversation with potential prospects or clients mm -hmm. um, in the community. So I run an accounting business that is focused on serving um, SaaS startup companies and SaaS stands for software as a, as a <laughs> software as a, <laughs> software as a service. <laughs> I know about that because uh, my background is IT, um, and I. It's really funny because I've had this discussion with my other half. I said, "Oh, my friend works with SaaS firms," and he's like, "You don't call it that. You call it software as a service." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's it's S A A S. It's SaaS." And he went, "No, it's software." As a service. <laughs> And this, we get we get used to using our terminology, you know, so we yeah. have to be careful with that. So, you know, we we once we niche down and again, you and I share our business coach. We we met through um, our, our group program that we're in with our coach, Natalie Ekdahl. And mm -hmm. one of the things that she really promotes for us and really focuses on helping us is to niche down. Mm -hmm. And as as scary as that sounds, the niching down is what helped to it just 
grew my business so quickly because it was so much easier to speak about who we serve, which is startup companies who focus in the SaaS, um, you know, space. And so it becomes very easy to, for people to refer us business or to connect us or introduce us because we're able to then have that conversation very easily because that's our space. That's our niche. That's our sweet spot. Our, you know, our area of expertise with startups because my background. So V, I, this is where, I mean, I follow various um, hashtags on Twitter, et cetera. And the startup world, it's got to be really, really super fast moving. How did you get into that world in the first place? And is it not like really super competitive to work with startup clients in Silicon Valley? Or is, there, is it just a massive, massive industry? So there's loads of room for everybody. Well, I think it depends on what role you're playing. Mm-hmm. For for me, I got into it by accident. I am the accidental, you know, person that I didn't even, back in the day, and I'm going to date myself a little bit, but back in the mid-90s, 1995, uh-huh. I didn't even know what a startup was. I just knew that I went to help out a company. I think there was a handful of, you know, the two co-founders and a handful of people, sales, yeah. marketing, and me, finance, accounting. Okay. Yeah. And so that company um, was... A, was in a building with the um, eBay, Google, a few other, you know, software systems. So it was those early, early startup days. Oh, and it was small then. Oh, yeah. so small, so small, you know, yeah. and it's like we would all take a break and go eat uh, a burger and fries and uh, have a beer, you know, and then get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> and really, the best thing that we had going for us is that we were so young and naive and we didn't really know what we were getting into. We yeah. just thought it was kind of cool to merge technology or, you know, this fast paced world that was known that became known as the startup uh, world yeah. where some of us were private and all of a sudden they said we're going public. Didn't know what that meant. We just knew what there was work to be done and we just yeah. were so open to, okay, what do we need to do? And we were carving out how to do things that were never, that never had been done before. Yeah. So that's where I came in accidentally loved it and realized I can marry this accounting f- traditional finance world with mm-hmm. technology in a very fast paced entrepreneurial world, because that's the beauty of a startup, right? Is that you have to be quick, quick to fail. Yes. Quick to fail so that you learn the lesson and you make the tweaks and you keep going. Yeah. And I love that because that's that has served me in my business as well. And one startup, you go public, it leads into another. You meet people. People go on to other careers or other, excuse me, companies. Yes. And then they're like, oh, there's an opportunity. Let me go and uh, collect. Not, you collect people along the way mm-hmm. and you connect with I'm a long-term collector of relationships. I, I still keep in touch with a handful of people from that first startup back in 1995. We went public in 1997. When you go through an experience like that, there is a bond Mm -hmm. that only those of you who went through it know what that means, what that feels like. So it's um, in a completely unrelated way. It's like um, people who grew up in Northern Ireland in the 80s. You can't you can't go back and, and think that you can understand that unless you came through it it's a completely different obviously but I totally get it it's just it's so exciting and interesting to me and um, that you came through all of that and I actually want to ask you is there anybody that you met in those early days who became like a mega mega millionaire billionaire person in the in your first yes <laughs> many and that's that's the whole thing right uh in the early days and again not really not even for a lot of us we didn't even know what stock options meant we didn't know how it could how you could negotiate or how it could impact your life and you learn along the way you sometimes you make mistakes but you also Mm -hmm. learn to ask questions and to educate yourself but uh yeah those startup companies whether it was through an initial public offering an ipo Mm -hmm. or through a merger an acquisition you know you you build a company to a certain size and Mm -hmm. then maybe a bigger company comes and buys you. So you, whatever you had there for in the private sector converts Mm -hmm. into that public. So all of a sudden overnight you could, yes, we know, I know quite a few, quite a few that um, you made, did very, very well. It was life-changing. It was life-changing. So when in your role in these companies, um, I told you, I was, I'm just fascinated by all of this. I think you need to write a book. But anyway, <laughs> in, your, in your role in these companies, do you get invited to the meetings as the person who can back up that, that, that 
yes, the accounts are in shape. Yes, this is what we have got. This is where where our value is coming from. Are you invited to those meetings or do you, does your company just supply the information that the, the startup team go forward with? Um, thanks for asking that, Louise, because it allows me to talk about the services that we offer. So I appreciate oh that. <laughs> not planned, not planned at all. But, you know, it depends what role the company hires us for. You okay. know, at times, you know, we we act as the entire outsource accounting department, which yeah. in there's different layers. We do the bookkeeping. We do the accounting, which is more the bookkeeping is transactional. The accounting is more of like analyzing, uh, reconciling accounts, making sure yeah. best practices are put in place. Everything is compliant. And then there's the what I call controller or CFO role, which is the role that I play in my own firm with our clients, which is advisory or yeah. strategy, letting them know some things that are coming up or some things to be aware of, to navigate mm -hmm. through, prepare for. Um, and we back engineer all the time, especially when I meet with a new client. What yeah. is your end goal? Is your goal to grow the business or is your goal to grow the business to sell, to go yeah. public? What is it? Because depending on their answer, we start to put that solid foundation in place. And right. so, yes, yeah, sometimes I am invited to either present numbers in a board meeting or mm -hmm. to prepare the financial package with some analysis to then, you know, distribute internally. And then we have external packages that go to investors. And I, whoever is my audience, I need to um, modify the language so whoever's reading that understands the, the performance because everything is about translating how, what is the, the health of the, uh, the financial um, mm -hmm. the financial health of a business. So in my corporate career, as, as I went up the ranks, I definitely was invited into the strategy, the budgeting yeah. conversations, yeah. as well as what the heck happened. Would you know, having to explain and walk through not only what happened, but also how are we going to fix it? And yeah, those were fun conversations. It's just, it is completely fascinating. I'm thinking of um, a friend of mine and Northern Ireland who helps startups his, his business is called Starticus and I'm going to I should have told him about this call in advance and of course I didn't so Alistair you, hopefully you're watching this back later um, and it's really interesting so how the whole startup world works you know they're they're looking for investors they need to have really solid background um, information about what's happening what's working maybe where I suppose it's with like with every small business you know, my I would go to my accountants and I'd say can you look at my uh, my accounts you know what how much do I need to set aside for taxes how much can I take out of the business how much can I afford to pay my team my staff and and un, a good understanding of those numbers I mean I did well at maths in school only because I had a brilliant teacher because otherwise I mm. was absolutely hopeless at it and mm. um, which is actually what I quite like about maths because if you've got a good teacher who can explain things very clearly, then you can get it. Absolutely. Um, but Absolutely. I don't I don't want to sit and wrangle all those numbers in my head, and that's why I have accountants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think of myself as a translator often times mm -hmm. because it's about translating all those numbers into a story of mm -hmm. like what happened and to do it as quickly as possible so you can adjust as you need to in order to keep going to hit your goals. Yes. And I do want to say, you mentioned something um, just now about startups, you know, when they go out and they're trying to get funding or th there's different levels of funding in those early stages as well. Yes. You know, oftentimes they don't have any historical data to prove their concept. They're still in mm -hmm. that, you know, proof of concept ideation uh, stage yes. of whatever it is that they're wanting to do. And so a lot of times what the investors invest in is the team, the co-founders, their yeah. experience, their, mm -hmm. and not even like the school or what you know where they came from although that does help sometimes but it is also what have they done where have they been what mm -hmm. other things because what they're looking for is can I bet on this person yes. can I invest in this person because they've got this proven record of being you know just really resourceful um creative mm -hmm. can do attitude and it's just a lot of different factors that go into those early stage investors well, um, that, be, that are looking yes yeah, so it could be even that the investors could be looking at the startup and thinking, well, who are they working with? And when they see that they're working with your company and they can see mm -hmm. the track record your company have, that has an influence on them thinking, well, they have obviously have gone to the right accounting firm. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that's so key because you're right. It's about, you know, it's almost like giving them that peace of mind or that comfort level saying mm -hmm. we take, if, if we're talking about numbers, you know, we're taking our numbers 
seriously. We're, we know we have to build a solid foundation from the very beginning in mm -hmm. order for us to, to build and grow this startup to where we want to go. And so it's, you know, it's all the relationships, whether it's the attorneys, the bankers, the, the, the accountants, and then the, the, whatever it is that they are doing, it could be the software development firm, or there's just so many different people that play a role in those early right. stage startups because they yeah. can't go hire everybody. They can't hire yeah. everybody in the beginning. I, I mean, just thinking about all those lists of people, it's amazing that anybody has a startup at all, I have to say. <laughs> I think you have to have a certain level of, uh, you have to have a different a different personality to go into that roller coaster that is a startup. I mean, yeah. it, you have to have a really strong stomach because there's a lot, it's, it's a roller coaster. Every day is different, which yeah. I love roller coasters, which is why I love that my clients, that's our niche, is a startup world. We know it really yeah. well. So. So I'm thinking about you know people who work in the in this what we call in the city. So in the UK, you're talking about the city of London and the people who go into those those jobs where you're the you're you're li literally buy and sell on on the the trading floor. But what are they called? Like are they called the traders? I don't know. The, the, yeah. The high intensity um, of dealing with that and how most people do it for a certain length of time and then they're like, right, that's enough. Because I can't keep going at this. Mm -hmm. I suppose for you, V, that's the beauty of hiring a team, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about you know who is in who is in fortified accounting. What does your team look like? What does your business actually look like? We have because of the services that we offer the mm -hmm. the the one time things would be like uh, the diagnosis that could be done by either myself or one of my high level um, accountants who have a lot of experience mm -hmm. and they are they have their accounting degrees but for the for the remote accounting that we perform you know the bookkeeping and accounting that like when we perform as an accounting department for a startup company yeah. we can grow with them we can do as much as they need or you know when they need it as they need it but yeah. it looks like this we have bookkeepers um, who do like the day to day transactional email management you know setting up of files we have a very organized, structured way of the, the, uh, storing the documentation. Can then I we just, have. Can I just say the way your brain works is the complete opposite of the way my brain works. It's very, <laughs> very impressive to see an option. <laughs> but that's why we. That's why we're. You know, we com, We com, We're compatible, and we complement each other because you can't have everybody thinking the same way. No, that's true. <laughs> and then be, uh, the next layer is our accountants, our accountants, which are uh, usually degreed accountants who um, have experience in specific industries in the accounting world. Um, mm -hmm. Most of us did not go to a public accounting firm. We didn't go work there. We've always been in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And they know the software systems. They know how the policies, mm -hmm. they know um, all of the rules that we need to follow in order for those books to look just right, to present mm -hmm. them just right. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the layer of like the uh, the vice president, or I've got a, 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 a director and myself. I play the role of a CFO for them. And those are usually analyzing the numbers, being able to advise, you know, what happened and what we may need to uh, do to adjust or what may be coming up. Yeah. Um, manage the cash, you know, do a lot of cash forecasting, budgeting to, yeah. like you were saying, you know, how much money. Those questions are at every level of a business. You know, there's a, you know, cash is king. So you need to make sure that you manage the cash. Where, when are we going to, how much do we need? When do we run out? How much, when do we need more? Um, okay. What can we do? The use of those proceeds. And so different, uh, my team is made up of the bookkeeping staff, the accountants, and then the higher level um, controller, director, CFO types. And we just hired our first, um, it's he's part-time, he'll start in a couple of weeks, but our first, like our office assistant, and we realized that we needed somebody who can do a lot of those administrative things that mm -hmm. none of us have time to do, nor should we be doing. You know yeah. that, right? We, we're both talking about that all the time. So he starts in a couple of weeks and um, we're just so thrilled that he's coming on board and it's gonna help us out even with the, the smallest of tasks or some of the bigger tasks that administration requires. And are your team, so before the pandemic, would you have had offices or has everyone worked from home or how does, you know, do you have a, a place? I have a place where I'm in my office now. I and um, the like the office assistant will come here uh, when needed. I have different workstations if people need to come here. But everybody's remote. 
which allowed me to be able to hire people that I worked with before. That's the beauty of networking also and building your dream team of people that I think about that I've worked with before. And it's like, I want that person part being part of my team. And so some people are local to me, but they still work remotely. Yeah. Um, And some people are in uh, different states. And so everybody's remote. Thank God, you know, for Zoom meetings and or, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft Teams. And, you know, it's just there's so much technology today that allows us to be able to connect and not be in the same office space. So I'm probably created by those people, those brains behind those startups from the 90s. Full circle. <laughs> Full circle, exactly. And so exactly. let's talk about um, networking and LinkedIn. And mm-hmm. you talked about how you've got a great network around you and you get a lot mm-hmm. of business through referral, which I love. So how do you nurture those relationships be online? You know, how do you proactively go out or go online to check out what people are doing? Is it yes. you know, yeah, or like yes. meet people in the coffee shop. But it's, it's, you are looking to see what they're up to online. Yeah, I do two things. You know, the, there's network. There's a network of people that I have become friends with and I'm invested in, in terms of not only because I want to see what they're doing, but also because I feel like I want to cheer them on. I want to be part of their cheerleading squad. I want to be part of that network that they have that is rooting them on and saying, you can do this, or I'm so excited for you. I know how long this took, Um, you know, being part of their journey in whatever capacity, even if they're not my client, or even if we're not close friends, if I I keep an eye on them, um, which is part of connection, right? If you connect with them, you can see the things in in the feed or getting press releases. But for me, I do actively, um, I'm going to, again, date myself, but about 12 years ago, I um, I was a chief operating officer at a financial services company. Yeah. <clears throat> and I say that because one of the things that we used to do every Friday afternoon is to carve out 30, 45 minutes to handwrite thank you notes. Everybody had to do in the management team, what? had to write 10 notes mm-hmm. to our clients, you know, to sort of say a handwritten note back then was like, what? Every, every, everybody's on email, right? Yeah. And it stood out because to get a handwritten note that yeah. you get in the mail that somebody put a stamp on that it, it's my handwriting yeah. and to just, you know, personalize it a little bit. Oh. That goes a long ways. That's what I'm talking about. Relationship building and collecting people. Even mm-hmm. back then we were doing that. And now I do a version of that. I, people communicate differently. I had to send a WhatsApp message this uh-huh. week and somebody else I texted uh, through the phone, you know, somebody yeah. else I sent a message through Slack. Somebody yeah. else was a message through LinkedIn and LinkedIn, because uh-huh. I had my phone with me, I wasn't at my computer. Uh-huh. I know that I can do a, an, a video or, you know, yeah. you can't do it on desktop. Right. And so I had knowing my audience, knowing my, my network or mm-hmm. how they like to communicate mm-hmm. is something that I'm really good at remembering. Oh, that person's on WhatsApp. Oh, that person. Oh, you know, yeah. So yes. And so they're receptive because yeah. I love reaching out to people when they're not expecting it. Yes, I will never forget. Like you mentioned Natalie earlier, Natalie Ekdahl of Biz Chicks. I will never forget about, well, it was definitely before pandemic. I, I feel like the last 18 months is, is squeezed into like six months. It's very weird. <laughs> so we're thinking maybe like three years ago. I remember on a Sunday getting a Voxer message from her out of the blue. I was like, ooh what is this? It was very exciting. And it was about inviting me. Was it inviting me to come speak at her conference or was it inviting me on the podcast? Oh. I remember. Anyway, it was just so exciting. And as you say, it was so unexpected. Mm-hmm. Even to get it on a Sunday, it was just, mm-hmm. it was like very, it was just really good. It was really good to get. Um, and it and- becomes a memory. Like, look what you just did. You just recall that and your face yeah. lights up and it becomes this really memorable event that probably didn't take her more than 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, so just- but that's the nurturing of relationships, of knowing the connectivity, the follow up, the follow through, the, like I said, cheerleading squad, um, mm-hmm. especially if you've been part of their journey for a really long time. Yes. And I think one of the things I was, who was I working with this week? I was working with, um, a, a, a local company so I was working with the whole team and I was explaining to them that when you connect with people on LinkedIn you have got to go you've actually got to share posts and comment on things because it's not enough just to connect with somebody when you are then commenting on their posts or you're sharing stuff in the news feed 
it brings you up and keeps you top of mind with people. So if you, you can go to an event and give everybody your business card in the olden days, the olden days, <laughs> uh, you, can connect with, you can connect with 100 people on LinkedIn in the next seven days. But unless you're actually engaging with their content, sending them messages, uh, mm -hmm. writing stuff they're interested in, it's kind of like, what's the point? You're going to come to a few years' time and say, Louise, I've got this network of 3,000 people on LinkedIn. I don't know who any of them are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm going to actually plug your your the podcast that you, you just uh, released this week, which is where you coached me on yeah. how to use LinkedIn for business on both my personal page and the business page. I think yeah. that if people can go listen to that podcast, they'll hear a lot of the, the questions that I asked are questions that a lot of us business owners have because LinkedIn used to be known just for connecting so to go get a job or interview mm -hmm. at and everybody knew when you were updating your LinkedIn profile uh oh uh oh <laughs> those days are gone <laughs> yeah LinkedIn has become so much more powerful and people like yourself which you're you know LinkedIn experts who are coaching us to use it the right way mm. even a little tip that you just shared is I just jotted it down because I'm listening back to my own podcast now taking notes because when we were you were coaching me I'm like let me pay attention and not take notes I'll listen back and, yeah. and get my strategy um, and take action because that's what we're doing and I have my team listening to it as well but honestly the so many people still think that you only go to LinkedIn when you want to change your job no, the mm -hmm. majority of people think that and they they don't um necessarily see the opportunity that it brings um, exactly to really, to really raise your profile and, and build on relationships whether you're a business owner uh, or working in a, a job or in a career it's all about relationships i mean that's one yeah. thing humanity that doesn't change doesn't mm -hmm. matter if it's online or if it's in person people still get work and jobs based on word yeah. of and who they know I mean exactly exactly and as you build if you're a business owner and you're building your business there because there's going to come times when you're looking to hire someone whether yeah. it's you're hiring an employee or you're looking to hire a professional in some capacity website designer photographer videographer whatever yeah. it is that you're looking for your network wouldn't you rather get a referral through your network and somebody who knows somebody who's worked with them than yeah. to just blindly go find somebody and hope that you're doing a good job filtering yeah. through and recruiting yeah, i would absolutely. much rather get that referral yeah that's even mm -hmm. um yeah, any any of that stuff um okay so v um one thing i want to ask you and it's a bit of a nonsense question but it's just one that i like <laughs> okay <laughs> we talked about oh. this on the podcast is with silicon valley the television program <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever work with a startup where everybody slept in bunk beds in one house, <laughs> had their the entire living room was just their computers and workspace? Did that ever happen to you? I absolutely did. Um, and I hope they don't mind. I'm going to, you know, shout it out. But at the time they were called Wheels, um, oh. W-H-E-E-L-Z.com. Okay. Um, ultimately, that company got uh, bought out by another company. But I joined them on January 2nd. I want to say 2012 yeah. and it was a house in Atherton right? and <laughs> and when I walked in you know I basically had I think there was like at that time already maybe seven seven of them uh -huh. um, a handful of them were living in the house 24 mm -hmm. 7 you know and it was like there was no furniture there was just tables and chairs and monitors and equipment uh -huh. um, until we could get the funding and go get the space which ultimately we did mm -hmm. um but it was it was you know uh different uh, I think I was the only female until we had a recruiter and mm -hmm. there was just a lot of engineers just working 24 seven sales yeah. guys. And, um, they would they take turns cooking, cooking breakfast, cooking lunch, cooking dinner. There was a nice backyard. So there was breaks and I still have a few little videos of, um, just mm -hmm. taking a couple of videos of, you know, the breaks and it's like, yep. The, I mean, that's, that we, was the environment, but they, we all worked really, really hard, long hours. And and it was stressful, but it was also a lot of fun. Um, so, yeah, well, it's well, just like they're, the, If they're called wheels, what were they selling? Like, let's so I, at the time, I hope I get this correct, but it was like, you know, they were developing that whole, uh, like Zipcar was um, one of the investors. And it was like the whole rental 
of the car. You know, if I had my own car and I went to, and you needed a car and you would rent the car through a mobile app and, you know, you would find out where the keys were and, and you would just, a lot of people in San Francisco don't have cars, yes. but they would need a car to go out of San Francisco and, or to get to another appointment or whatever. And so, yeah, so they were developing that technology and awesome. the installation and, and it grew very quickly and mm -hmm. funding got in, you know, we brought in funding. We ended up moving. I think I have a video of that too, of packing up the house and everybody driving away. And, oh. um, but we also got, you know, noticed we got a knock on the door because there was a way we hired more people and the neighborhood, it, it's a very affluent neighborhood. Oh. Um, I think we rented that house because ultimately that house was going to be torn down and rebuilt. So we were like, why not? Why don't you make some rent in the meantime? So it, we got a knock on the door from a sheriff because it's like, what's going on here? And what's happening in this house? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's not what you think. <laughs> and if you went to the bedrooms, there were a couple of bunk beds and more than a couple of so yeah. people could spend the night and sleep and yeah. Yeah, those, but they were such fun days. That's oh, part of, yeah. you know, you, and I met some wonderful people that I, they go on to do other things and yeah. start other companies and they have re then reached out to me and hired my firm. And mm -hmm. I'm still working with a handful of those that moved on and started other companies. And that's part of your networking, right? And delivering yeah. really good service, showing up, um, creating an experience because they're not going to remember everything that you did, but they're going to remember how it was to work with you. Did yeah, they feel absolutely. confident? Did they have yeah. peace of mind? All those yeah. things. So, so I that's another thing about you know. Do you think a lot of people in the startup world once they 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 create a business from scratch as a team, they build it up, they get investors, they go through all of that, they sell it. Do you think they literally go if they don't go with the company? Do you think they go right? What's the next idea? Oh yeah. Yeah. Over and over again, which yeah. again, those of us who understand that concept, it goes back to relationship building and mm -hmm. how are you helping? How are you showing up? What kind of experience are you creating? This is a really small world. Well, most of my clients are here in the Bay Area, San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I have had other clients in other state and um, other states, but it's usually a big as, you know, city like Boston. Yes. Let's say. So, yeah, you know, we they go on to do the next thing because they it's in their blood. You know, it's mm -hmm. like they are idea guys. They want to create something and they understand when it gets to a certain size, mm -hmm. that's no longer their sweet spot. They're ready mm -hmm. to let go. Oftentimes when we the company gets sold, there's always a period of time that they have to stay on to help with the transition. Yeah. And, and but they're already thinking of the next thing. Yeah. Oh, I love mm -hmm. that. I mean, mm -hmm. I can see myself in there in another in another life. But um, because I'm like, you know, I have I have other business ideas that I have to keep keep just putting in a little box, put to the side. Really. <laughs> Not <laughs> yet. Not yet. <laughs> Distracted. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, Natalie would tell you that. Natalie yeah. would tell you that. Our coach, yeah. our business coach, would tell you that. <laughs> hey, this has been. I think this has been a really fascinating insight into the whole ecosystem you work in. And I want to thank you very much for sharing with us. And uh, we didn't have any questions today, um, but I think probably people are just completely enthralled with learning <laughs> all this. So if you do want to ask us questions and you're watching this on replay um, later on, um, guys, do put a question below because we'd love to help you um, answer any of those questions that you Absolutely. have. And Absolutely. This was so much fun. I really enjoyed this. So in true Silicon Valley style, are you having like, you know, keel for lunch? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm going to have sushi. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you oh. for inviting me, Louisa. I'm always, I always have such a wonderful time with you. We have a lot of fun. We yeah. laugh a lot and I appreciate you um, inviting me to have this conversation. Well, I have loved every moment of it. I could ask, I could honestly, I think you should write a book because I asked you a hundred million questions and that would just literally fill your book. Um, mm. Everyone wants to check out V. If you are in the startup world, um, go and look Fortified Accounting down here. Um, or if you're just really interested in amazing women who start their own businesses and run and build teams, then you should be connecting with her on LinkedIn regardless. Thank you, um, Louise. And thank you so much for joining me today.